I think the first point that has to be made about this particular election is, is that this is the first one in something like two decades, which is outside of the context of a war. We are in a post-war situation. And then, given that, the measure of violence has to be considered accordingly. And it is with deep regret that we have to record that this election campaign actually does compare with that of 2005 and 1999, and that in certain respects, the figures recorded are higher than that recorded in 2005 and 1999. There are some new features in terms of election violence in our practice, in terms of the issues that we've had to monitor, and I'd just like to enumerate that. We've had in this election, I think, a scale of abuse of state resources which has not been registered before. We have, and very importantly, and this is a point necessary, to go on record, throwing up his hands in despair, publicly venting his frustration that his authority is being flagrantly abused. Now, for us, this is of particular importance, given that we are an election monitoring organization, and our principal concern, therefore, is the protection and strengthening of the integrity of the electoral process. And if one looks at, at the institutions and processes of governance, which after all, given that an election is the basic mechanism for choice and change in a functioning democracy, it gives one an illustration of the state of health of the institutions and processes of governance. And with deep regret, we have to say that when you look at it, in terms of what public officials have said, what they have done, the violence and malpractice recorded, we have a picture of dysfunction and breakdown. This is indeed particularly sad and tragic and regrettable for us as election monitors that the chief officer charged with the responsibility for the conduct of this election has had to go on record venting his frustration. He has said that his competent authority, who he first appointed and then had to withdraw, was humiliated by the state media. This has been reported in the newspapers as well. The scale of the abuse of public resources, the issue with regard to transfers, the intervention of serving military officers in the campaign, the whole problem with posters, cutouts, and podiums. The whole question with regard to also, as this is an I pointed out, the registration, voter ID documentation in the North and East with regard to IDPs and other citizens in the North and East in particular. So there is a scale of issues and challenges which needs to be brought to everyone's notice, and in particular, to the notice of the authorities, because if at the end of the day, we go through electoral processes, each time the integrity of the process is, again, challenged, we will be in serious problems, I think, with regard to the institutions and processes of democracy. So I, I want to flag that. At the same time, I do want to say, that given our experience in monitoring and our understanding of the Sri Lankan context, that at the end of the day, notwithstanding a flawed electoral process, that if enough Sri Lankan citizens go in large numbers, as we have always done in the past and for over six decades, go in large numbers resisting the violence and the intimidation, we go to the polls then we may well get a result that at the end of the day reflects overall the wishes of the people of this country. But it is important nevertheless to reiterate that the institutions and processes really need to be strengthened and protected. That there should not be any concern of fear and failure. 
that the police, the election officials, all those involved in this process can act independently according to their professional codes of conduct and according to their conscience. After all, there is no need at the end of the day for special laws, really, if there is a political culture that is committed to democratic governance. The election does therefore point to a violence that is embedded in our political culture, a zero-sum political culture, which we need to really seriously address. It is also therefore for us, as the Center for Monitoring Election Violence, and indeed our constituent uh, members, we have gone to court, we have been in the forefront of advocacy campaigns with regard to the full implementation of the 17th Amendment to the Constitution. I reiterate this. The 17th Amendment to the Constitution, as most of you will know, is that amendment which sets up a constitutional council, which in turn leads to the establishment of independent commissions, the police, public service, and an election commission as well. That amendment is not being implemented at the present moment. We do not see it as a panacea. We do not see it in itself as sufficient. But we certainly do see it as pivotally necessary in order to provide the support, the legislative support, the statutory support for the individuals involved in the conduct of elections to actually function. It is indeed a tragic irony that it was the violence and malpractice in the course of elections in the past that served too as a catalyst for the 17th Amendment. And now it is not being implemented, and as a consequence we are seeing a peacetime election characterized by violence and malpractice. So one hopes nevertheless that at the end of the day, that despite the flawed process in the context of the campaign, that on election day, enough of our fellow citizens will resist the violence and intimidation 